Oi. Complex fractal trainability boundary can arise from trivial non-convexity. This one's interesting. If you've seen my stuff in the past about fractal trainability boundaries in terms of learning rates and stuff, this one's pretty cool. It gets more at the heart of what's probably happening here with uh, whenever these boundaries do show up. Uh, unfortunately, not too many actual crazy graphs or things to look at. There's very descriptive and good conceptual ones to look at for sure, but nothing like the nothing good for a thumbnail per se, I don't think. But uh, that's uh, besides the point. Points to learn. Uh, let's actually uh, get to it. On a sample two-layer neural network, gradient descent was recently found to have a fractal boundary between learning rates that lead to bounded and divergent loss, or fractal trainability for short. Check out, I have a video um, from, I want to say, two or three months ago maybe, that uh, just look up fractal on my channel, you'll see it pretty quickly. Consequently, a slight change in hyperparameters can change the training results qualitatively with little hope to choose good hyperparameters in advance. So what that previous paper was doing is they were saying um, the guy trained a gazillion, uh, so many, just two layer feed forward networks and trained them on different learning rates. I believe he had two variables confessing. Sorry, my mic, I apologize if that hurt your ears or something. Um, I believe he was messing with two different variables. So it was a grid search, not a single line search. One was learning rates. The other, I'm not sure what it was, I forget. It might've been just, uh, the, he might've separated out learning rate of the second matrix versus the first matrix. I can't quite remember. But basically he was finding that when you mess with these learning rates, you can just keep zooming in basically forever. And you find that whether the uh, model successfully learns or diverges, totally just a fractal like shape, very a uh, natural looking fractal too, not a very Mandelbrot style, more of a, how do you pronounce it? Lyubinov or whatever it is style, very um, natural and um, organic looking. Here, we aim to explore the mechanisms underlying the fractal trainability boundary and the key factors influencing its fractal dimension, guided by the intuition that non-convexity renders the gradient sensitive to parameters. Um, so that's just uh, that's the actual assumption they're going with here. The hypothesis is that we can analyze convexity and figure out if uh, that is what causes these fractal, uh, fractal learning rate uh, training boundary. And um, just for some background on convexity, uh, I'm assuming if you're a math person, statistics, AI machine learning, uh, even plenty of the fields like economics, for example, you understand convexity. Um, the idea, I'm going to do a probably in many places incorrect quick crash course for you though. Um, how do I switch back to my iPad? Here we go, right? So for a given function, it might have a shape some type of way. Here is a quadratic. Here is, I don't know, cubic with some bias or whatever this is, right? Um, the, the rough idea with convexity is think of it as just, if I grab any two random points on the actual function, then I should be able to draw a line between them and have that line not touch the function itself, the function line. Any random two points you grab in here, uh, it will not touch. Therefore, this function so this one's hard, it's like very close up, but this function is convex because of that. Um, and then a non-convex function, basically if I grab two random points, there is a risk that you will end up with it crossing the actual function line. So this is the issue right here, right? Um, that's not quite a perfect way to describe it per se. And there's the whole like convexity versus concavity. If you're aware of that is more just a reframing of the exact same problem. Um, but that's about all I'm going to actually get into for describing what's happening with that. And we'll see in the actual paper, uh, these graphs it has as examples. So we first elaborate the key intuition of why certain non-convexity may lead to the fractal trainability boundary, right? If non-convexity can make the gradient sensitive to parameter to a parameter, after we shift the learning rates a little uh, at a certain step. So basically they made uh, these, started off with a convex function, AKA just a simple quadratic. This is equivalent to a mean squared error loss, I believe they're using. And then they added uh, a non-convex function here it was either a sine or a cosine, I forget. And what happens uh, when you add a sine or a cosine to a quadratic is you get these little ridges and these ridges are the thing that makes it non-convex. You grab two random points in there, draw a line across. It's probably going to intersect with other points of the function. And they did two versions, an additive version 
and a multiplicative version. So when you add by sign, the important thing to notice is that adding by sign, the bottom of the function, this uh, the actual point of interest to optimize towards, uh, is the largest in terms of non-convexity, whereas when you go up on the edges, like top left or top right, and as you keep going up in that direction, it's actually closer to convex. The, um, the, the magnitude of the sine function is relatively small in comparison to the actual uh, numbers that you will be seeing when you go on a quadratic function to the far left or far right, top, up and to the right, up to the left. And whereas multiplicative is different with a multiplicative, uh, when you multiply quadratic by a sine, sine or cosine function, what you find is that the actual critical point, the place you want to optimize towards, that is the relatively almost convex parts near convex. Whereas when you go off to the edges, top left and top right, and keep going, those are the parts that get really, really non-convex. And that can possibly lead to different uh, results. And they tested both of them in this paper. So uh, a xk plus one, which I presume means a uh, next iteration in, uh, so yeah, so a k step. So we're referring to our steps in training as k. So on the next training step will be a little different from the one obtained with the unchanged learning rates. So what they're doing here, they're starting to train a network a little bit, so just having it train a little bit. Then they are splitting it into two different networks and giving one of them a slightly different learning rates. And that slightly different learning rates, um, if we had uh, not fractal, just regular smooth trainability boundaries, it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, but because it's fractal trainability boundaries, what we're going to find is that very small change in learning rates is going to have a huge impact on the actual likelihood that the model trains despite being just a very, very small edit. And we watch those two models or that one model as it splits into two as we try to train it separately with the learning rates, how those two diverge from each other. However, the gradients at the new, uh, the new step will be very different um, because of the non-convexity leading to very different subsequent iterations. Notably, the sensitive dependence on learning rate is sufficient to generate chaos while it is not obvious to yield divergent training. So that's a big thing here is the um, previous paper did find di uh, divergence as in the loss just actually went up. Like it was terrible. The model got atrocious. Whereas uh, the only thing you can guarantee given uh, a certain level of non-convexity is chaos, meaning the model starts jumping around at different loss levels unpredictably. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But divergence is a wholly more extreme phenomenon of it just goes way out into space with the values. We thus need to do experiments on specific functions if, to test if non-convexity with sensitive gradients can lead to fractal trainability boundaries. You would, um, I guess in the case of just chaos and no divergence, you might call it uh, not fractal because the loss still stays in a reasonable range um, and maybe even can somewhat train a bit uh, temporarily at a given at a given random point, whereas the divergence is a serious boundary. Uh, construct our loss landscape by perturbing the convex quadratic function. So as we're saying here, the quadratic function right here means greater our loss. Perturbing, I believe, refers to the additive multiplicative sine cosine, whichever one it is. And then the simplest regular perturbation, yep, it's a cosine function. They do have two hyperparameters here, an epsilon to change, I believe that would be the amplitude and then gamma or lambda would be i think wavelength don't or don't quote me on that um, and then added to perturbation i already described that one and then multiplicative perturbation i also described that the two cases are qualitatively different as when x goes to infinity the um, additive perturbation x going to infinity means going to the top right or also top left for negative infinity the additive perturbation will become small comparing to a uh, quadratic function x squared, while the multiplicative perturbation is always comparable to the unperturbed x squared when you go up towards infinity. That's what I was saying earlier, how the um, uh, top left and top right are very small for additive, but they're very big for multiplicative. It kind of switches, it's a reverse scenario. On a given range of learning rates, uh, we can evenly put, uh, we can evenly test out across that range n plus one grid points with uh, which as a gradient descent can be tested to diverge or not. If two neighboring learning grid points values lead to the same divergent slash bounded loss behavior at this coarse grain level, we say there is no boundary between the two grid points. So key thing here, 
we have some range of learning rates to choose, right? S min and S max. We can't actually choose every single possible learning rate in there, obviously, because there's infinitely number of numbers in there. So we have computational limits on how many models we can actually train, which we will define as a N plus one. I'm not sure that the plus one, I don't know why that's there, but like there, anyways, it's just the number of actual models will train across that range of learning rates. And we're going to say, all right, um, that's the highest resolution we're willing to do. Um, in theory, if we were to do a larger number, that's like a higher resolution, but um, N plus one's our largest uh, resolution level. And we're gonna say, okay, if two um, points right next to each other on that range of S min to X max, or S min to S max, uh, are both diverge or both converge, then we, we say there is no, we say there's no boundary, there's no fractal boundary in there. And if they do, uh, one diverges and one converges, then we say there is a boundary there. Otherwise, we say the segment between these two grid points is a boundary segment. We define a set BN as the set containing all boundary segments when we have N plus one grid points. So we're gonna collect and find out along our range how many actual uh, fractal boundary points there are there. Heuristically, we expect each boundary segment to cover one boundary accurately when the segment length goes to zero. So in theory, if you were to not use n plus one points and you were to actually train an infinite number of models across this range of learning rates, then you would be able to actually get the full correct uh, fractal dimension, um, but that's just an in theory. And thus bn becomes the set of boundary learning rates um, when n goes to infinity. Uh, but of course we're not actually doing that. Uh, if the number of boundary segments denoted by magnitude bn increases with respect to n as a scaling law asymptotically, we say the train then we say the trainability boundary has a fractal dimension. So what that's saying here. We're going to test out and actually do this at multiple ends, multiple um levels of resolution across our learning rate range. And we're going to measure and see, okay, uh, when we go from very small resolution, maybe the smallest would just be S min and X max just themselves. And then we go higher, higher resolution of many points in between S min and S max. What actually happens to BN, to magnitude of BN, AKA the number of, uh, what's it called? The number of boundary segments, right? What happens to them as we go N towards infinity? And we, um, we fit them to a scaling law. And we say that uh, if, they fit a scaling law asymptotically, and we actually find, um, we can predict through that, uh, we, then what happens is the scaling law, this alpha that is fit to, the actual parameter we fit, ends up being our fractal dimension. If you're unaware, uh, fractals uh, implicitly in their definition, uh, they do not have a easy number of dimensions, one, two, three, four dimensions we're used to. Uh, they have a decimal dimension we call it a fractal dimension they are actually in between one and two dimensions or in between two and three dimensions 2.2768 or something right and this is how we estimate the actual fractal dimension in the case of data of this type what do we have here what am i missing so the number of boundary segments indeed increases when we do test on the multiplicative case And our findings reveal that the trainability boundary for this simple function displays fractal behaviors, meaning the number of boundary segments increases following a scaling law with n at large values. The fractal dimension alpha calculated via least squares as the slope of log bn. So even though this is the actual equation for our scaling law, in reality, to do a linear regression on it, you do use your log rules and or rearrange the equation with logs on both sides. And we find it is approximately 0.996 plus or minus 0.005, right? A similar analysis on another loss function, and this is a standard deviation, not a confidence interval. A similar analysis on another loss function with multiplicative perturbations yielded a fractal dimension of 0.837 plus or minus 0.004. This suggests that fractal boundaries are more densely packed in a narrower range for the additive perturbation scenario indicating a potential, potentially less erratic behavior. That's interesting. So we actually find that the multiplicative uh, case, you could say is more fractal, more erratic in its uh, sensitivity to the learning rates, whereas the additive case still is fractal and erratic, but less so. We found that for the additive perturbation case, 
the fractal dimension increases with decreasing wavelength and increasing amplitude, while for the multiplicative perturbation case, the fractal dimension has no clear dependence on amplitude or wavelength. That's interesting. So we saw the um, these equations earlier, remember, the uh, how we actually take our original uh, quadratic function right and how we turn it, uh, we add on the sine cosine or multiply the sine cosine, I think it's a cosine, right? Um, we find, remember, we have the amplitude and the wavelength hyperparameters, and they want to test different values for this epsilon and this lambda. And what they found uh, was that they actually did matter for the additive case, but did not matter for the multiplicative case. And the manner in which they mattered, what, what did it say here? Uh, fractal dimension increases with decreasing wavelength and increasing amplitude. And that makes sense. Think about it. So we look back at this uh, right here, uh, it, decreasing wavelength means that those little waves get closer together, right? And increasing amplitude means the actual waves get taller in height, right? So what, what that means is th that lines up with being less convex. When you make the thing less or you, not that there's a such thing as like less convex versus more convex per se in that way I'm using it, but when you make the thing more jagged, it gets a, a more intense fractal degree. When these lines get more jagged, closer together, um, it creates more erratic behavior, which makes sense. Uh, so they actually looked at these two variables, the um, amplitude and the wavelength together, and said that they could actually combine them into one single measure of, what did they call it? It'll say it here. Claim the, we claim the fractal dimension can only depend on theta plus, since it only depends, they used a word to describe it, the ruggedness or something? Roughness, it's called roughness. So this value here, amplitude divided by wavelength squared is called the roughness. Uh, we claim the fractal dimension can only depend on the roughness since it only depends on epsilon and lambda and is invariant under the renormalization transformations. We would call the quantity, oh, it says it right there, roughness, as it is in the pre-factor of the second derivative of the additive perturbation. That's uh, annoying to talk about, annoying to read. Measuring the sensitivity of the gradient's dependence on the parameter. We plotted the fractal dimension as a function of roughness. Uh, and found the fractal dimension shows a clear and sharp transition from zero, i.e. no fractal behavior, to non-zero when increasing roughness, right? And that is figure 2c. Where do we have that? Figure 2c. So um, what do we have here? Uh, it doesn't actually use roughness as the units. It looks like x or x-axis is wavelength lambda, y-axis is amplitude epsilon, and c is the multi c is the additive case and d is the multiplicative case so on the left is additive on the right is multiplicative and you see here uh with on the right multi multiplicative case when you mo mess around with the wavelength and amplitude there's really no clear relationship whereas on when you mess around with amplitude and wavelength on the additive case on the left there is a relationship and you see that there is a little range on the bottom right right here uh, which corresponds to a lower fractal dimension of zero, uh, whereas most of them are closer towards one, but not quite hitting one. And I believe, what is A here? Uh, the top left one, for additive perturbation case, we studied learning rates where the number of boundary segments increases as a scaling law, with respect to the number of segments input, suggesting a fractal shape of the boundary. Uh, basically, as they increased the resolution, so the x-axis on top left here is log n, the resolution. When they increase that, uh, what they get out of the scaling law is, it's, it looks like it's zero for a while and eventually turns. Oh, the, so the, the number of uh, boundaries is zero for a while and eventually starts going up, aka it suddenly phase shifts into uh, actual fractal dynamics. Uh, the roughness determining fractal dimension for multiplicative perturbation case is just epsilon, just the uh, amplitude, whereas for additive it was the epsilon and lambda, amplitude and wavelength. For the multiplicative perturbation case, we found the fractal dimension decreases a little 
with increasing roughness. So there's a slight relationship there. Beyond simple cases we can analyze, we next did a slightly more complicated lost landscapes. As a first step towards perturbations and multiple length scales, we considered additive perturbations with two cosine functions. So they're messing around here, um, adding a second scale uh, of, of sine, cosine, whatever. The renormalization can only uh, say, what's this, roughness of the first of the first term and roughness of the second term. So there's a combined roughness when you add those two together, determine the fractal dimension and cannot yield a single variable controlling the fractal dimension, the fractal behavior. So these two terms, when you add two different sources of roughness, do not have any way to simplify them down. They really do end up being independent in this additive case. We found the fractal dimension depends non-monotonically on each of the amplitudes. However, the claim that fractal behavior behaviors arise when the loss becomes non-convex is still valid. We next explored how the dimension of parameters x affect the trainability boundary. The results suggest that the fractal dimension does not change much with respect to d in the, multiple, in the additive perturbation scenario. Um, d, I believe, is the model dimension, right? Yeah, so... Yeah, the, the, given an input vector x within um, real numbers to the power of d, aka a length d vector, uh, we find that the results suggest the fractal dimension does not change much with respect to d in the additive perturbation scenario. For multiplicative perturbation case, um, they define a different class of functions to multiply by their cosine uh, and do different levels of roughness at different scales. We found the fractal dimension alpha in the multiplicative, multiplicative case slowly increases in this case with respect to decreasing model dimension, which makes sense as the high dimensional optimization should be more complicated. That makes sense. Higher dimensions have a harder time with fractal dimensionality. Fractal dimensionality, bleh. Uh, constraints in our numerical implementation also impact the accuracy of the fractal dimensions we obtained. So that is a issue here that's not like issue for this study. It's more so an issue for any sense of like attempts at really understanding lost landscapes as we are using floating point numbers, which do limit our accuracy. For instance, computational resources cap the largest feasible n. Uh, so also, yeah, just we're capped in terms of we can't actually perfectly measure fractal dimension because our level of resolution when uh, looking at different learning rates is capped by our computation, limiting the number of data points available for accurately fitting the fractal dimension. If a fractal boundary is densely packed with a very narrow range, a significantly large n is required to discern its fractal nature, potentially causing us to overlook certain fractal behaviors when n is limited. And so it could be even more complicated as m if we had more computation to actually look at more learning rates. Interestingly, the practical significance of these fractal boundaries also comes into question. Narrowly distributed boundaries are unlikely to be encountered in most applications, thus posing a minimal risk. So these, these boundaries don't necessarily exist across every possible learning rate all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? Um, in reality, they probably have a, a boundary within which they exist. And these boundaries, uh, some of them may be very narrow. The actual, um, when you were to look at it, the actual like, kind of like a, a boundary line between uh, divergence and convergence is in reality, because these bands are most of the time probably so narrow, that would be why we don't actually see a huge issue with um, fractals messing with our training regimes in most AI models. Uh, this observation led to a new insight. Fractal dimension alone may not suffice to assess the risk posed by fractal boundaries. It also becomes essential to understand the distribution breadth of these boundary points. You can't just look at fractal dimension. You also have to look at where are these uh, actual areas of the of the search space, uh, like actually. Um, where is the actual divide showing up? Is it across the entire search space or is it just like a thin line that you could be looking further into? That is it for today. Hope y'all enjoyed. Like, subscribe, comments, all the YouTube things. Join this, what's it called? Join the Discord to discuss. Support on Patreon or with that YouTube join button down below if you'd like. Thank you to those who are already supporting. Uh, also hit the bell, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, end of video.